Hello, everyone. I will try to keep it interesting since you just came back from lunch. So talking about nation state actors, uh, first some definitions. When I'm talking about nation states, I'm talking about intelligence agencies, spy agencies. All the countries have them, and in this talk, I'm not going to separate them between military and uh, civilian, since it's going to be more abstract around how they operate. Typically, national states are there to do the dirty work for governments and military. What I mean by this one is that uh, there are certain things that uh, there are two big components of what they're doing. The first one is collecting information to answer questions. The way they do that is typically using means that are illegal outside their country. On the other hand, in many countries, not in all of the countries, they are also doing operations. Uh, for example, in the US, they call it covert, covert action. In Russia, they call it active measures. In uh, some European countries, they call it uh, special intelligence operations. There are many names. In summary, it is not only understanding the threat, but changing the outcome. For instance, it could be influencing elections. It could be uh, participating in some paramilitary operations, supporting certain insurgent groups. It could be bribing. It could be all sorts of activities, even going as far to assassinations or uh, yeah, like actual genetic operations. So for instance, where cyber fits into all of that? How many here are uh, familiar with the Jamal Khashoggi case from 2018? Okay, a few people. So for people that are not familiar in 2018, uh, that person, a journalist, was assassinated in Turkey, and that was later attributed to the Saudi intelligence. And you would say, okay, what this has to do with this talk? Well, later it was discovered that both his mobile phone and his family's mobile phones were compromised. And we don't know if that was part of the operation, but we can assume that maybe it helped plan this operation. Okay, so having given this uh, general introduction of who of what I'm going to be talking about. So why am I qualified to talk about this? That's a good question, because I have never worked in any intelligence agency. And that's probably also the reason why I can, not talk, I can talk about these things. Like, I never had any clearance, which means, yeah, I'm just talking about open source information here. Uh, so I have been working in information security for some time. I started from the offensive security, vulnerability research and exploit development. And then I switched to the blue team side. So I know that some of the work that I initially did ended up being used by nation states. But uh, yeah, a little switch sides. <laughs> so some of you might know me from a blog that I have been running for more than a decade. And uh, initially, it was most, again, about exploit development and then more around uh, uh, intelligence topics, uh, cyber espionage, and so on. I have also talked about uh, lots of different topics in the last few years on cyber espionage, some more technical, some less technical, like this talk is not going to be very, very technical. And uh, also, for the last couple of years, I started a YouTube channel called The Spy Collection, where I'm sharing some of the things I have acquired over the years of researching that area. Some are physical, some are digital. And I also started this year a newsletter which is called Spy News. And uh, here is the interesting part with this one. Every week, there are multiple stories about espionage around the world. But uh, what we see, it is only two kinds of stories. Either stories that are intentionally out there. For instance, an agent might want to pass a message, so they are control leaking that information, or things that went wrong, so an operation that didn't work as planned. Now, all of us work in different areas, and probably all of you understand that when you do your work, you are going to make mistakes at some point. And this is probably what gets in the news of uh, the spy news, let's say. But on the other hand, also probably all of us know that when you work, I don't know, like probably 90, 95% of your time, you do your job right, nothing goes wrong. So that means what we see is not even the tip of the iceberg. It's like probably the, the snow that is getting blown on the tip of the iceberg. This is what we see when we are reading about espionage stories. Still, it's pretty interesting, but keep that in mind, that what we see is a very tiny portion of what's happening out there. And you see that I'm merging cyber and espionage. Since, uh, like in the Khashoggi case and other cases I'm going to be talking about, there is a very strong relation. Like uh, for nation states, what they care about is the outcome. And in many cases, we have to combine multiple disciplines to get to that outcome. So uh, we have to be aware of both worlds. It is not just cyber espionage. Now, as you can imagine, probably you saw in the previous slide, I've worked in booking.com, so very unrelated topics. This is my personal research. It has nothing to do with my employers, so just be aware you have it's all personal stuff, and uh, I will also not accept questions for my employers since I'm not presenting anything related to uh, booking.com here. 
Okay, so starting today, first I will start with the assumptions that I had for making this presentation. Then I will go to the private sector, since especially the last few years we hear like, since I'm doing the spy news, I know that every other week we have some news about NSO Group. And NSO Group is not the only company that's doing that, and it's not the only company that's offering services um, that are related to nation states. Once we cover the private sector, I'm going to go to the main area with the public sector and then some key takeaways. So the aim of this presentation is mostly to give everyone food for thought and uh, raise a little bit the awareness of what's happening that, yeah, it's not only fishing that we hear every day. I'm not saying fishing is not happening, I'm just saying there are other things that happen that we kind of ignore. So, on the assumptions. The first one is that uh, all of the big APTs that uh, historically we have been very impressed on how they did their operations, Probably they never stopped doing operations. We just stopped seeing those operations. The second one is that uh, not all nation states are made equal. And uh, you can probably imagine that, that when you have organizations like uh, Russian GRU, thousands of people, a lot of resources, then you have other countries, like very small countries, but maybe the whole population is like two, three million. Apparently, they will not have the same capabilities, and they will also not have the same resources. Then we have agencies, like, for example, in the US, that they are having a global focus. They want to know what's happening all over the world. Well, you have other agencies in other places that they only care about the regional space. So not all nation states are made equal. Both on resourcing and capabilities vary a lot. Then what I'm assuming that you are all here and also the people in the live stream, because you are interested in uh, this kind of topic, that uh, you understand fishing it does happen, it's really high volume, but there are other things that might be happening out there, and you might want to be protected against them, especially if your threat model involves protecting against nation-state uh, level threat actors. And lastly, uh, we have some anecdotal evidence of this one, that nation-states learn from their mistakes, but it's really hard to say that conclusively for all of the nation-state actors. For instance, in uh, the Vault 7 in uh, WikiLeaks, there is a wiki page that it was from uh, the CIA, and in there, there is even a full page when Kaspersky managed to attribute a lot of their activity to the equation group, where they are doing a retrospective, and they are looking to, okay, what could we fix to avoid those mistakes in the future? We should change this, this, and that. It's a pretty interesting read to go through that. But uh, again, that is one instance. Most likely, this is what happened in other agencies as well. And we can also see that a little bit from the development of the implants, that it changed over time and uh, they evolve. So most likely, when we release some research to the world, that research is going to be received also from those nation state actors, and they will take steps to make sure that they are going to fix those issues in the future. OK, so moving to the private sector. Uh, the main three questions, so that uh, again, this mostly to make sure we all speak the same language of what we mean when we say that. Why do they exist? What are they targeting? And how big of a market is it? The first one is pretty simple, considering the assumption. They exist because there is a need for that. Not all of the countries have the capacity to build all of these things on their own. Not all of them have the knowledge and experience to develop those things. So they have to rely on somebody else. And this is why the private sector provides almost anything you can imagine to intelligence agencies. However, uh, here, for the sake of presentation, I had to let's say, limit it down and put in some buckets. I know this is not conclusive, but I try to put that in three areas, and I'm going to cover them. The first is infrastructure-level signals intelligence solutions that are covering things like telecommunication providers, ISPs, and so on. Then specialized SIGINT services, let's say vulnerability research, reverse engineering, and so on. And lastly, tooling to be able to provide small groups of people. So we're talking about either individuals or I don't know, maybe dozens of hundreds of people, maybe a couple of thousands, but not anything beyond that. There are way, way more things. I'm very happy to discuss them afterwards. Uh, yeah, I even have an inventory in my blog with uh, lots of these companies uh, that are offering the offensive cyber capabilities. I think it's like 140 that I have so far, so it is not just NSO group. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that leads us also to how big of a market is it. It's a multi-billion dollar industry, and the reason is this one. They are offering anything you can imagine from telecommunication level solutions all the way to zero days and very tailored solutions for their customers. Most of the information we have is from leaked contracts that leak over time. For instance, uh, it was, I think, last month that we had a contract leak from Intellexa 
that was an 8 million contract. Uh, last, the month before that, we had one from the Thai government, a contract agent that was leaked. So from time to time, we get to see how, uh, how much th those solutions cost, so we can make an estimate. Uh, I can guarantee you, you will never see anything that is below a million. Like, <laughs> I have never seen any contract that is cheaper than that. And the interesting part is that uh, here is a very tiny subset. As I mentioned, there are hundreds of companies like that. You might recognize some of them, so I don't want to blame many of them. They are literally offering a service, so I'm not saying anything against those companies. I'm just saying it's a huge market. Those are some of the bigger names out there. And it is heavily based on trust and professional relationships. Uh, here is an interesting exercise if you want to do that. Pick any of the big companies around uh, this space. You can even go to my blog, 140 of them. <laughs> And then see the people that work there, just go do some uh, OSINT on them. You will see people that are on marketing, on sales, and so on. Most of them come from the government sector, and then they switch to the, the private sector. And this is key because a lot of them are heavily based on having this trust relationship. Like, you couldn't imagine intelligence agents going in the wild and like, uh, asking, hey, I want to buy a zero day, just reach out to me. They need to have those relationships. And uh, of course, there are some conferences that are closed for this kind of audience uh, that um, intelligence agents and these companies are going together and they are presenting their tools. But most of the time, it is heavily based on professional relationships and trust. Also, in some countries, they are not even allowed to have an online presence. If you want to sell the services to a government agency, you are not allowed to have a website, uh, like a domain, nothing at all. You, you should not exist on the web. That probably also gives you an idea. What we see, again, is a very tiny portion of everything that's out there on these companies. OK, so now probably we'll have the same understanding of what I mean when I say private sector in this context. So let's go a little bit on the infrastructure level, which I would say is the most innocent, because you can find tons of information about this uh, for what I'm going to cover here. But still, it's not very well covered topic. And that's the LI system, the lawful interception systems. So every country that I have researched, has these things installed in their telecommunication providers, of course, including this country, but like any country that I, I have researched, and that is a lot of them, like more than 20, 30 countries. How they work is pretty simple. They demand by law the telecommunication providers to install them in their networks. They are tapping on the network traffic, and then through a legal process that is different per country, they are allowed to issue a, an LI request, which means for that person, we want to intercept everything that they are doing. And here is something that is not widely communicated. This is not intercepting only voice, which is what you'd assume, like okay, phone calls, or like wiretapping traditionally. It's intercepting anything that this telecommunication uh, provider has access to, including data, including metadata, including, uh, in some cases, they have abilities to track sessions, so you can build sessions from, so you have, have easier experience browsing the collect information. Um, they also support next generation networks nowadays. So, many different capabilities, and that exists everywhere. You would say, OK, yeah, I trust my government. They will never abuse this technology. Maybe. It depends. <laughs> um, but uh, then there are other versions of this one. So there are many different models out there. And the one that you might hear if you start looking into that is uh, the Russian version of it called SORM, System for Operative, for Operative Investigative Activities. Technically speaking, it's uh, almost identical to what we call in the West lawful interception. There are really minor differences. And there are a few others as well, but I mentioned just those two, because if you start looking into those two, you will get into a rabbit hole and you'll find a lot of information. Uh, especially, actually, the Russian initially was built for the FSB, the Federal Security Service in Russia, so that they can use it for investigations. But then they started also, the companies that built it, also selling it outside to other, other countries that are, um, let's say, friendly to Russia. Then we have another part of the private sector that it is not so innocent, let's say. Uh, I use this example because it is easy to find information about it, but there are many similar products out there. It is uh, from Finn Fisher, a product that they call Finn ISP. And again, a, a government can install it to telecommunication providers. And what it does is similar to the lawful interception in terms of wiretapping the traffic, but it's online and can also inject traffic. So it can do many in the middle attacks. And you might be asking yourself, why would someone do that? Well, because this way you can compromise systems almost transparently. You can inject exploits uh, in a session of a person, and they will never even know that this happened. Again, from country to country, it heavily depends on how those are used or abused. 
there are entire legal frameworks around those, but uh, as with any law, yeah, and the intelligence agencies that operate in this really gray area, there are countries that are pretty strict on how they operate them and countries that are a little bit more relaxed on how they use them. So some considerations for uh, those systems, the infrastructure level uh, SIGINT solutions. First of all, we all think, okay, let's say, I fully trust my government, they will never do anything bad with those things. It doesn't matter that they have them installed. Well, okay, but what happens when you travel somewhere else? What happens when you talk to someone in another country or your traffic, their communication goes there? Uh, what happens if your internet, for whatever reason, is routed through another country? It is not only your country you have to be careful of. There are other players in this. And uh, another area is that, uh, now imagine you are on a nation state actor, you're in a signals intelligence agency. It could be really awesome having access to a foreign country's uh, lawful interception system. Pretty cool, right? You would have like, all your interception already in place. You just have to enable and start spying on people. And the last, actually on this one, uh, yeah. The, it did happen. In 2004, the US did exactly that in Vodafone in Greece. And um, the Vodafone at that point was using a system from Ericsson for lawful interception. And the NSA had developed a, a rootkit using the language of that system that was called Plex. And you, like, I guess the question is, okay, how they managed to install it? Well, here's where we go back to the combination. They recruited a network engineer working in Vodafone. The most, uh, let's say, sad part of the story is that when this leaked and became a scandal, and that happened because the Olympic Games were happening in general when you have international events like a spy magnet. You have lots of people going there, and of course, spy agencies have an excellent opportunity to reach all of those people at once. Uh, but the sad part of this story is that that engineer was uh, found, suicide. he committed suicide, at least this was the, the initial uh, assessment when this uh, scandal became public, but uh, later on, I think it was 2017 or 18, the court decided that was a murder. So again, it is this where you see the cyber meeting the real world. Okay, but that is like almost 20 years ago, an isolated incident, we could say. But when Snowden did his leaks, we found this slide deck. This is from the NSA, and it says, exploiting foreign lawful intercept round table. You can check out the slide deck if you want. It's public on the internet. I think the intercept leaked it. And um, in there, it has like a whole inventory of uh, like 10, 12 countries that the NSA was doing exactly the same thing. So it wasn't just uh, Greece. Another thing to remember, even if your country doesn't abuse the systems they have, maybe some other country is abusing them for them. And the last part I mentioned about the um, thin ISP or similar products that can many in the middle and inject traffic. Now, you might say, okay, yeah, they cannot inject anything, like we have HTTPS, we have uh, like a perfect trust, a perfect secrecy, and everything is working nicely. Based on most statistics, only 89% of the internet traffic is HTTPS. And now think for yourself, like in the last couple of months, didn't you have that time that you browsing something and you ended up in a not secure site? Now if you were part in a target list, that's the only time that was needed. They could inject in that HTTP response and exploit it, and Boom, they have access to your device, that, that's it. And um, actually, from uh, Snowden's leak, we even know that they, they were building automation around this thing. So they, didn't, they were not doing these things manually. They would just have a target list, and the moment they were able to get some unencrypted connection, of course, it was far, far easier back then, they were immediately injecting the exploit and it was getting back to the system to feed all of the data uh, back to the NSA. So it wasn't like a human doing that, it was full automated. So, okay, that was a pretty sad and opening part. So what can we do? First of all, let's accept that we all operate in very hostile networks. The second part is encrypt everything and not just enable encryption, but research what are you doing. Like, does it make sense for what you're trying to encrypt? And yeah, don't rely on the defaults. And the last part, if, you ha if we have any researchers here that are going to look into that, Look into network-based attacks, like men in the middle tampering with network packets. Can you find any injections? There are lots of areas that you can look into that level, like the network level of uh, exploitation. Then we have the more straightforward part of the private sector that they're offering services like, uh, okay, can you find a zero day in that target platform? Can you build us an exploit for this vulnerability that we have? Or we got these two exploits, but we don't know how to make them work in a nice production-ready exploit chain? Or we have this uh, very obscure device that we try to hack because of X 
uh, adversary of ours is using. Can you help us reverse engineer it and uh, see how it works? Or we managed to capture this malware and we want to reuse it for our own purpose. Can you help us figure out how to make it work? So those are very common scenarios in this space. And um, here, again, we have to consider, could we do anything around this to protect our hardware and software? And that goes back to a lot of the talks that uh, also happened uh, today and yesterday about ethical hacking. How can we make ethical hacking more, uh, more appealing and reverse engineering adopted in a wider way so that people don't have to go to that route and we reduce the, the amount of, uh, let's say, good vulnerability researchers and reverse engineers that those companies get some considerations. And uh, how can we defend that justice? Again, encouraging ethical hacking. We should not be assuming that anything we buy is secure. No device should be assumed that it's secure because someone said so or it has a stamp of some sort. Unless you have stamps like uh, the ones you see there, which like uh, it has been reviewed by the German intelligence, the Swedish intelligence, the European Union intelligence. But I guarantee you, most of the things that we buy as, uh, let's say, private companies, they will not have these stamps in any case. And um, yeah, the other thing is that uh, maybe we should switch our focus and instead of trying to, to protect the whole platform, can we protect the, whatever is running on the platform, the, the uh, workload? Uh, think about this. Let's say the network is compromised, the platform might be compromised. How, how can we make sure that whatever we deployed in that system is not getting tampered and no one is touching it in any way or form? Because if we do that, we don't really care about anything else. We, we can assume everything else is compromised. That attaches a little bit on the zero, uh, zero trust architecture, which is like a big thing nowadays, but it's a nice consideration to think of it this way. And uh, another area is if you have especially any OSINT uh, enthusiasts, is uh, to look around what all of those companies are looking for when they are hiring people. For instance, we have one of the, let's say, very well known companies that are acquiring zero days for nation states that are, from time to time, they put things like that. It says we are temporarily doubling our bounty for Chrome chains, remote code execution, and sandbox shape to one million. Well, how you could read this is like there is a customer out there, a nation state, that pays a lot of money for this. And in some cases, they are saying things like that for very specific software and hardware, which means as researchers, maybe we should shift, uh, shift our focus there and see, OK, do we see any active exploitation? Do we see anything going in the wild around this space? And even more interesting is uh, job listings. Here is another one. I removed the name of the company, apparently, because it is not just a single company. It's all of those that are doing that. So this is why I really don't like all of that, blaming a single company, whether this is, uh, I'm not going to name names, energies. So if you read this, uh, like it looks like a normal advertisement, but let's highlight a few things. I will read them for you because they are tiny, probably. The top says, possess an active top secret sensitive compartment information clearance or above, or an ability to update a clearance. The second one is experience performing vulnerability recent ex and exploit development for desktop and mobile. And the third thing I have highlighted is ability to take unknown hardware and or software systems from initial triage to reconstruction of system architecture through reverse engineering efforts. So this is a nice advertisement. How I read it is that uh, they want someone to be embedded in a US government agency, give them some obscure hardware, and try to find a ways to hack it. Again, it can give you a lot of indication, especially some listings are even more detailed than that on what they are looking for. OK, and now we go to the, probably the most popular area that is all over the news, exploitation frameworks. There are so many out there, uh, apart from Pegasus. I just named a few and added a few screenshots of some of them. Now, what is the selling point of those? It is that it's a point-and-click solution. The operators that buy them, they don't need to know almost anything. They go through a very minimal training, a few hours of training, and uh, then they learn how to use it. Those uh, things, basically, they say, I want to hack this person. Uh, here is the mobile phone number. And um, if it is a more, if it, let's say it's a zero click, they don't, do, do, they don't need to do anything else. If it's a one click exploit, they might need to add, like, OK, what message do you want to send to that person? And everything else is happening on the background on the platform. You can realize that uh, this has a very specific market. For instance, uh, let's say really huge agencies, like I mentioned, like the GRU or the NSA in the US, they probably care more about the exploits that are being used rather than the platform because they probably have way better solutions than that. But when you're talking about smaller agencies that they don't have this uh, capability, they would love to have something like that. How those are charged typically is like a cost for the platform per year, a subscription. 
plus additional module for anything the people buy per usage. For instance, you could say, okay, I want to have a zero day for um, iOS. Okay, it's going to be plus that amount of money per 100 users, and, and so on. And because of that, they are very limited in use in terms of you cannot use that to spy like in a whole country. You can use it to spy dozens of people, hundreds, maybe thousands, but up to that, it's not something beyond that space. Again, all of them are multi-million uh, subscription fees. And here's the interesting part. Almost all of them are cloud-based nowadays. So you, if you look carefully, you might be able to find some of those in the wild. Now, what we need to think about from our side is that uh, yeah, those are for small groups of people. They are not for anything else. That, uh, almost all known cases that we have, like uh, anything from Citizen Lab, Amnesty International, from uh, Washington Post, like there are lots of things that have happened over the, like, just this year. They involved some zero day, either one click or zero click, which again shows there were a few, very, very few cases that was uh, like traditional phishing, but that's the exception. Uh, I don't have the exact number, but uh, it is way less than 10% that it was uh, phishing. Almost everything was zero days. And uh, the other thing is that uh, a lot of people get uh, really obsessed with iOS. However, the top target is Android. In all of those platforms, if you see what's the top demand is Android. Yeah, apparently because more people use Android, but again, it is not iOS. So what can we do as uh, defenders? The first of all is awareness training and teach people operational security, personal security measures, like when to use their phone, when not to use their phone, what they can say in their phone, what they cannot say on their phone, all of these things. And of course, uh, there are a lot of things that we could do on the protection side, like for that thing to work on the phone. Think of it, yeah, it could be a rootkit, it could hide itself, but still, it could need to do some operations. Can we see those operations? For instance, uh, like uh, one thing that's usually referenced is the battery lifetime. So do we see a change in that? Another one that I find more efficient is the data usage. Those things need to exfiltrate a lot of data. So that should be visible somewhere. Also, if you have some sort of Wi-Fi interception and your phone is using Wi-Fi, again, it needs to reach out to command control servers to send data. You might be able to capture those things. And uh, yeah, as I mentioned, those are cloud-based, so with a little bit of research, you might be able to find them online. OK, now move to the public sector. And does anyone know this person, Andrew Bustamante? I'm a fan of him. No, OK. So he's a recently retired uh, CIA clandestine service officer, and he's doing lots of different interviews and podcasts. So I took two quotes from him from two different podcasts here. So the first one is this one. The US military has something called Cyber Command. Their job is all cyber warfare. So not only does it happen, not only does it happen frequently, but it happens frequently, and nobody even knows it's happening. That's what makes really professional intelligence work happen. That's why we call it clandestine. Going back to what I mentioned at the beginning about what we see in the news, it's a nice addition to that. And the second quote is about the targeting side that we're talking here, that once you become an intentional target, then your security apparatus, they will create a dedicated, customized way, a vector of attacking your specific security apparatus. And because security is always after, there is the leading advantage and the trailing advantage when, we, when it comes to attacks. The leader always has the advantage because they have to create the attack before anybody else can create a way to protect against the attack. I guess it's common sense, but still I found an easy transition from the private sector to the public sector and the connection to what we see in the news. So public sector is a relatively easy way it exists to inform the government and military of what are the threats. And uh, there is another nice podcast here from a former JSOC member uh, talking with a former uh, military intelligence analyst that in, during the discussion, they estimated that from their side that it was, well, their side was killing terrorists. So it was a very niche area in the intelligence side. But still, 70% roughly of the actionable, uh, actionable intelligence they were getting, it was from signals intelligence. And that also explains why all the governments are putting so much effort there since it provides value compared to, uh, compared to other disciplines. This is also why we see so many cyber activity, because cyber falls into SIGINT. I will explain that uh, shortly. So what are they targeting? Anything of potential interest to that specific government or military. And this is why monitoring geopolitical news matters. If, let's say, a politician comes out and says, oh, we really disagree with that government's position, and uh, we're going to take steps against it. I can guarantee you in the background, intelligence is already working on that. 
Uh, there is also, a, a, let's say, a slightly difference here of culture change, in, especially in the last 10 years. Before, it was really like that, like very targeted and specific. What we see in the last few years is that the many governments, especially in the European Union, because in other places it was already happening uh, to some degree, they started moving more to, OK, let's collect everything and then filter from that. And I will give just a few examples, since we have limited time. Uh, for instance, just last week in the Netherlands, the regulator of the SIGINT agencies of the, Nether of the Netherlands uh, uh, resigned because uh, his name is uh, Bert Hubert, if you want to check it out, because he said that um, there is a push from the agencies to tap on all of the, traffic of, all of the internet traffic of uh, the Netherlands and then filter out whatever they see as interesting based on um, AI and uh, smart, let's say, rules that they filter out whatever they consider relevant. And of course, this, this is not, let's say, the best approach, but um, yeah, this is why he resigned, because there is a push for that. Similarly, in uh, Germany, it was uh, 2018, I think that the BND, the German intelligence, got access to the Frankfurt Internet Exchange to do the same thing. And uh, well, very recently, also, in the last uh, year or so, in Denmark, we had the uh, military intelligence scandal that came out with the NSA. That um, I'm not going to the scandal if it was a scandal or not a scandal or it was a secret agreement or whatever, but the important part is that through that we also learned that they had full tap on all of the traffic of Denmark and they were using that to, um, to collect intelligence. And how big of a domain is this? Uh, it goes back to what I mentioned. Not all of the APTs are, are equal. It really depends on what they are after. If you are talking about someone like uh, the US or China that they want to have global reach, of course, they will have way more of these things happening compared to if you talk to a smaller country, I don't like a small country, let's say, well, in any case, you understand, like small countries that may care about what's happening in the region and not so much anything outside of that. So that heavily depends. And uh, yeah, just give an explanation. Hopefully that shows up yeah, with the colors. This is like a purely semantics. In, in practice, it doesn't mean that much. But signals intelligence in the Western world typically we split it to ELINT, which is electronic intelligence. You can think of it like emissions of device. Like let's say you have a spy plane flying over and they can identify, oh, this is a tank of that version. Oh, this is an anti-aircraft system. This is that. And then you have the communication intelligence, which is what we care about, which is anything that has to do with transferring information. And of course, computers fall into that. So we have like a, what I mentioned that is called bulk collection or in the news mass surveillance, so the things that talk, like wired up everything. Then we have uh, what is called in the NATO CNO, computer network operations, so that we can, well, it's network operations with using computers. And uh, the two areas that we care about in this talk is the CNA, computer network attacks, and those are destructive or disruptive uh, operations. Think about, uh, let's say, a nation state doing a denial of service in another country's communication network. And uh, actually, in 2018 or 19, BlackBerry Threat Intelligence did a black hat talk that they found a DDoS botnet that belonged to the Chinese government. So also governments do DDoS, it's not just uh, hacktivists. And uh, the second part is the CNE, computer network exploitation, which is what we can bundle as what most of us understand as hacking. It's how do you exploit computer systems to get access into them. And then you have the more traditional voice interception, like interceptive mobile phones, uh, traditional phone lines, and so on. So this is the space that we are moving in this talk, the comment SIGINT part. OK, so the bread and butter of SIGINT agencies is cryptology. And cryptology is the combination. You have cryptography and cryptanalysis, making crypto and breaking crypto. So has anyone ever heard here those things? Firefly, key exchange, high assurance, internet protocol and crypto, and Rasbeck encryption. Anyone? OK. Well, probably even if you did, you might not feel comfortable saying that. So those are um, encryption algorithms used today by nation states that are classified. And that completely trash is the whole point that we have that cryptography has to be public and everyone needs to know everything about, well, not if you are a government. If you are a government, everything you use is classified and is not publicly knowledge. And uh, those are some that you might be able to find some information in the wild, but there are many more that there is no information out there. Why is this happening? Oh, actually, before we go there, did you know that GCHQ had independently discovered public key encryption, asymmetric cryptography, but they kept it a secret? Anyone? Okay, a few people. Yeah, it's a pretty interesting story. 
uh, it, it was discovered roughly the same time, but they kept the secret because they thought it's such a big advantage compared to the adversaries that they don't want anyone else to use it, so they can spy on people, but they cannot get spied upon. And this goes a little bit on why governments decide to use their own things. It's uh, because this way they can, let's say they find the flow in some, those, first of all, those are not like entirely new algorithms that have nothing to do with what we use. They are typically optimized or modified versions of what we use um, in the public space, in the, let's say, pri as private people. So um, what they did, let's say they find the flow. They can immediately fix it on their side so they know they are protected. And then they can start the discussion, okay, should we fix it in the actual algorithm? Maybe we should not. Let's do a third assessment. Or it could be, oh, like for this specific communication system that we have, we can really optimize the crypto if we do this, this thing, and that. But if we release it to the general public, they might find out that, okay, this is not the best approach the way they do this crypto. So, okay, let's not do that. So it is not like some super sort of, it is like a big secret for, for how they do crypto. But I mean, it is not something extraordinary. It is optimizing more or less what is out there. And of course, there might be other things that I'm not aware of that are fully customized that have nothing to do with anything that no, they might exist. This is based on open source formation, so you never know. I really like this. This is the SIGINT intelligence from Australia. And their motto is literally, reveal their secrets, protect our own. I found this the best description of why cryptology is so important to those agencies. This is literally the bread and butter, not from now, even if you go back to World War II. This is what those agencies were established to do. So going to the modern world, what does it mean? Again, a Snowden slide on the top right, that it is from a, an office that existed back then in the NSA. It was called the Office of Target Pursuit. And the specific team that did the presentation was called the VPN Exploitation Team. Pretty self-explanatory. The, the whole purpose to pick up VPN solutions, find flaws, and find ways to exploit them so that if at any point anyone in the US government wanted to hack a system, they had something already available to use that. You can see like, uh, what they were doing is provide VPN vulnerability analysis, engage network security products, convey meaningful feedback to customer, customers, anyone that might ask them for a hacking solution, basically. Develop and sustain exploitation threads when possible, suggest alternative approaches if passive exploitation is unrealistic. And, oops. Sorry. Uh, and of course, decrypt, 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 which means if they have already found a way to bypass some VPN, they might be able to decrypt the traffic. The second screenshot that I have is from 2014, from Cloudflare, that we still don't know if it was the NSA behind it, which goes back to the deniability, why those agencies do exist, to be able to do shady things and not being able to easily attribute it back to them. And if you want to research for that, just search for the uh, dual elliptic curve uh, deterministic random bit generator. This is what they try to introduce, which to this day, it is still unclear if it was a backdoor or not, but it seriously looked like a backdoor from the NSA. And then we have the biggest case of all that was like 50 years of continuous backdooring devices, the crypto AG case uh, that uh, the German BND with the CIA and some support from the NSA, they acquired a vendor that was providing encryptors for lots and lots of governments around the world. And uh, they did something super smart. They were picking specific customers and they were either changing the manual so they can set the device in an insecure manner, or they were making a slight modification that it still look, looked very, very secure, but they had a way to reverse it and break it. And they did that from 1950 all the way to 2018. At some point, BND uh, pulled out of this deal, but the CIA continued on their own. Still a, a very interesting case of a combination of cryptology and uh, also um, supply chain attacks. So what, uh, what they are doing, these uh, agencies, those are a few examples. They are doing, of course, intercepting traffic. They, uh, all of the SIGINT agencies I was able to research, they have cryptologic units that they both verify that the solution is secure and also try to break solutions of their adversaries. And um, we even now have a few private companies that are doing that, which is great. We should have more private companies that are picking up solutions. They try to find flaws in cryptos. Like yesterday, there was a nice talk from uh, Unciphered that they do these things uh, in a different scope because of for, uh, cryptocurrencies, but still they try to break crypto using very traditional methods, like what we see uh, in this case here. And uh, some considerations. So let's assume, based on that, uh, that hardware appliances might not be as secure as advertised, or we don't know if they are secure unless we check them. 
Also, in, when you do encryption, do you just enable whatever is recommended, or do you do your research? What would work best for your case? For instance, depending on your data flow, your hardware, on your kind of communication, one type of encryption might be better than the other. Or a cipher suite, a specific cipher suite, or settings in that cipher suite. And the other thing that uh, I'm not sure if people take as seriously as, this, as they should is that encryption is the ultimate security control. Think about it. The network, let's say, is fully compromised. The device is fully compromised. Someone can read everything that we send over. What can protect us? Well, if someone reads everything, but they cannot understand what we're sending. And what should we do about this? First of all, never assume something is secure unless you have some assessment. I know like, uh, none of us is a cryptanalyst expert that can do this work, but there are some uh, trustworthy vendors out there that can help in that part. The other is uh, research what you are going to be using for crypto. This, the third point is probably the most important. Your ways for managing cryptographic, uh, team, uh, the team management for cryptographic material should be like the most secure thing you have in your organization. Like it, nothing could even go remotely as secure as that. This is what is the cheese to your castle. And uh, of course, governments take this very seriously, but private companies, I'm not sure if they are taking it as seriously. And uh, if people are interested in doing research, of course, finding flaws in algorithms is pretty hard unless uh, you have a team of cryptanalysts and mathematicians and uh, uh, computer scientists. But uh, finding flaws in the implementation is far simpler. Something to consider. Most of the flaws that we have seen so far is in the implementation. Then we have, uh, yeah, security appliances that might not be so secure. So this will be pretty quick. It's about um, leaks that are, have been out there. So Vault 7, it was mostly used by uh, the CIA. 23 projects were leaked and the Confluence switching used by the CIA. No references to phishing anywhere. Actually, if you search, there will be like a couple of references. But if you open them, it is not from the wiki. It is uh, reports that they were attaching from vendors like CrowdStrike, FireEye, and so on. So their own content has zero phishing reference nowhere. What they have is a lot of firmware implants, lots of them. Then we go to shadow brochures a few years after 2016, mainly used by the NSA. Zero reference to phishing. What they had, tons of zero days. Remote code execution, local privilege escalation, lots of zero days. Also, many of them for vendor appliances, specifically network devices. I listed the top ones that were exploited, and email gateways. Lots of those. Again, areas that, uh, to the best of my knowledge, most companies are real, not really putting a lot of attention on securing. Because we assume we buy something and it is secure. And Snowden leaks that it is uh, the harder to search because it is documents. It is uh, 483 documents uh, in total that have been released. Zero reference to phishing. So what we see over there, if I had to abstract all of those documents, it could be the targeted collection, which is where they have teams like uh, the VPN exploitation team or the ta tailored tax operation that are going after a specific target, developing something specifically for that, uh, as, uh, using the quote from uh, Andrew Bustamante. And then you have the bulk collection that uh, it is, OK, how do you wire up like entire internal lines? And uh, people always talk about Prism, but Prism is not that great, because Prism, they literally had a legal agreement with those companies to get the data. Not that exciting, but upstream is more exciting because they were tapping on the fiber. Far more interesting. And basically, all of that goes to some different databases that they have, big data solutions. And then they have lots of analyst tools that they use on top of it, uh, with the most popular being XG score. That NSA did such an awesome job that they even offer it to partners. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if Swedish intelligence uses it. I know other neighboring countries are using it. And um, lots of European countries are using XG score. You can think of it like a, you have all of these databases. How can you say, if I ever see something much in this pattern, please alert an analyst or please do this action, more or less like a, yeah, an analyst querying tool. At least it used to be like that until the last leak we had that was 2018, I think, on a, a, manual, a development manual for uh, XG score or XGS, XJS. Here is another interesting uh, part of the, this leak. I will just quote this part. This is from an internal NSA communication. It says, this is about router hatching. For this post, I'm not talking about home ADSL router. I'm talking about bigger routers, such as Cisco's, Juniper's, Huawei's, used by ISPs for the infrastructure. Hatching routers has been a good business for us and our five eyes, five, five eyes partners for some time now. But it's becoming more apparent that other nation states are honing the skills and joining the scene. 
that is also going back to Lucas' talk from uh, yesterday on uh, the Cisco switches. It looks like, yeah, other nation states are honing the steel cement to this day in this space. Yet, on uh, our side, we do not pay a lot of attention to that space. And this is, a, remember I mentioned about thin ISP, how they were doing men in the middle? The NSA had their own tool, they were calling it Quantum, and it was a similar approach. It was tapping on the network traffic, and uh, it had a like, automated list of who are our targets, and when it was picking up a target, it was uh, immediately injecting some code to redirect them on what they were calling Fox ACID server, and uh, think of it like an exploit kit. And from there, they were getting access to the system. We know that this was used and at least until 2016, if not uh, further, because a slingshot, that was a JSOC operation to hack some uh, people in Somalia and uh, Africa in general, it was using that to inject malicious DLL updates on MicroTik routers. So if they were seeing people trying to update their routers in that specific part of the world, they were installing, they were pushing malicious DLLs uh, in the updates. OK, so attacking appliances, I already briefly covered it. So hard to detect. Pretty easy to implement because those things don't have a lot of hardware security. They are pretty basic. And highly percent thumb because no one is checking those. The downside, very specialized, limited uh, system resources. They, have, they do not have a lot of RAM, CPU, and so on. And uh, you need some really good reverse engineers to figure these things out because there is not a lot of documentation. Recent cases. 2018, the case I mentioned about MicroTik. 2021, Iranian servers were wiped with an ILO. ILO is like the BMC uh, to manage the server. Firmware implant. Interesting case. We still don't know how this got in there. They just bought some new servers, and they came with this uh, wiper pre-installed. Maybe a supply chain. Who knows? Uh, other recent cases, it is uh, also raised yesterday from Trusek. They did a pretty nice uh, presentation. It's the wipers that the Russian GRU used to target Ukraine. Most of them were uh, installed by insiders and some uh, default credentials, but still there are a few that we don't know how they got in. Interesting case as well. Uh, this year, the, the CISA Cyber Security Infrastructure Security Agency released three zero days on firewalls and um, voice device that they are used by nation state actors. And uh, Kaspersky found two UEFI based routes that the uh, Chinese actors are using. So, as you can see, lots of things are happening in there, but we are not always seeing a lot of activity. If you think like in the whole year, I'm certain that there was way more things than those happen. Supply chain, we are in this space, so now pretty hard to detect because we depend on lots of suppliers. Again, highly persistent, and it provides extensive access because typically a supplier has multiple customers. So even if initially your target is one customer, by getting access to this single supplier, well, now as a bonus, you get all of the other customers. The downside is that it's highly targeted, like uh, how it works is you need to identify which supplier is used by all of your targets and then go after this specific supplier. So if that supplier has higher security standards, it will make it a little bit harder to get into. So more high cost, more complex, but high reward as well. Of course, I had to mention the SVR case, the solar winds, that they compromised tons of companies. Uh, those are the ones that were listed in uh, Reuters, but I'm certain there are way more than those. Interesting part on the solar wind chase that I'm pretty sure people are familiar because it's very recent. All of the reports that we have today, even the government reports, nothing mentions how the initial, happen, the initial access happened to solar winds. It would be good if anyone knows, please let me know. I couldn't find it anywhere. Uh, then on uh, the Ukraine side, uh, when the, invasion the Russian invasion started, we had like 70 or 80 Ukrainian government websites getting defaced and uh, putting like pro-Russia messages. How this happened is that they had compromised a company uh, that was offering October CMS and another IT development company called Kitsoft that they were maintaining all of those websites. So they didn't target one website at a time. They just hacked the supplier of all of them. And of course, this is not that new, but uh, that CNA, Chinese PLA operation Aurora, it is such an amazing thing if you want to research that area. Uh, basically, what they had done is that uh, they compromised RSA, that uh, at that point it was producing some key fobs for, for two-factor authentication called Secure ID. And the only thing they stole is the seed so they can get all of the customers uh, to a fake token. Then they used that to hack into Lockheed Martin, uh, uh, like uh, lots of commerce. There is a big list, and uh, they stole lots of information. It's a pretty interesting case of supply chain. Uh, also, CIA has a venture capital company. I'm not sure if you know them. It's called Incutel. 
It's officially CIA, it's not like I'm matching this up, you can look it up, they say that. And they maintain a list which is the software supply chain compromises that they document. This is the trend line, but I'm not so sure I saw lots of things missing from there, so I'm not sure how they define supply chain attacks. But uh, yeah, this is uh, according to CIA's Intel, what they see supply chain. Now, an interesting consideration. We all know all of the news that, okay, China could use Huawei and TikTok to spy on us because they have access to this equipment. What happens if, let's say, for instance, the crypto EG example that I mentioned, that's called Operation Rubicon, for 50 years they were spying on people. Do you know how only three people in crypto EG actually knew about this? How? Because the people from BND, the German, were not going as, hey, we're BND, they were going as employees of Siemens. And employees of the NSA, where they were not going, hey, we're the NSA, let us build this crypto device. No, they were going in as contractors from Motorola. Does this mean that any time we use Motorola, we should assume the US government has access to it? I don't know. Just some food for thought. Uh, also, remember in 2013, Snowden leaked some very... Uh, also, by the way, it's not the only companies. So I'm mentioning anecdotal uh, evidence. Like uh, in the UK, Rakal was the same with GCHQ. So there are many such companies. The, yeah. I don't want to blame specific companies for that. Uh, Snowden leaked in 2013 a photo of um, NSA employees in the customs in the US opening tamper-proof packages of Cisco routers, flashing the firmware and repackaging them that they were going to specific customers. Maybe this is how the ILO implant got to Iran. Who knows? Uh, another thing in, uh, in this space is a very interesting case in, in Iran that uh, it's called the Tinar's case if you want to check it up. So those were some uh, engineers that the CIA recruited to sell certain parts to Iran because Iran couldn't buy those because they have all of the embargoes in 2008 to 2010. And of course, those parts were faulty and they caused like, uh, their nuclear systems to fail and break and they had all sorts of issues. And then the Swiss government figured out and they tried to prosecute those people. So it's an interesting case. But what I want to highlight this one is that supply chain is the bread and butter of spy agencies. They have been doing that for several decades. It is not, yeah, of course, now we sit in the cyberspace, but it's not something new. They have been building fake companies, they have been buying companies to, uh, to target their customers, so it is not anything new, both for hardware and software. So why do we keep on seeing phishing and not all of these things? Because, first of all, this is what we're looking for. We have such good telemetry, detection tools, everything for phishing, that it is almost impossible to miss. Like a, I would be impressed if people can evade like modern email security solutions out there. It's pretty amazing what, what they can do. The other is that, of course, nation states do use phishing. Of course, we have attribution, we can see that, but the question is, when do they do that? For instance, they might say, okay, let's have this operation running all the time, it's a low risk, even if it's discovered it's us, it doesn't matter. Or, for example, in Russia, they are in war, so of course, they are going to lower the standards in terms of risks. Like, yeah, they know it's us, it doesn't matter. Let's go after with everything we have. So, and also, agency doesn't mean that they have, like, uh, all of the super hackers out there. They might have a team that they are super capable, and they might have another department that they are not that capable, and because of bureaucratic reasons, they might not be collaborating. So, it might be that one unit is using something that is not so sophisticated. But the question we should be asking is, when, why do they use phishing, and that's not something from all of the previous examples that I showed. The other is uh, because this is what we can see. And what I mean by this one, imagine the case of, uh, let's say, government A wants to hack uh, this specific uh, company in uh, some country, I don't know, like in uh, some place in the world, and they only target 10 specific routers in that company. Unless we have sensors in all of the internet in that country, in that ISP, we will never see that. Even if it's super noisy, even if it's not ideal, we do not have the telemetry to see that. And the, most of the cases of these operations that we're talking about, they are either passive, which means they are catching things on the wire and they are not modifying anything, or they are very targeted. So it's not that they, it's not happening, it's, we cannot see that they are happening. So closing. Focusing on the right threats, and what could we do? The first is take the things that I mentioned here, like network-based attack, supply chain, zero-day crypto analysis. Think like a nation state. If you were in that position, you had all of your, those tools in your, in your toolbox, in your, in your arsenal, and you wanted to target your organization, 
what could you use? How would you do it to be as deniable as possible? So even if it gets discovered, you cannot say who did it. The other part is that do not trust third parties that they say provide secure solutions. Find a way to verify them. Whether this is having your own people, whether this is hiring a company, whether this is going through some very exhaustive compliance uh, verification, not just a checkbook, not just a, a checkbox. Find a way to, to do that. Don't assume they are secure because they have a stamp. The other is that uh, I think by now it should be pretty clear. Signals intelligence is one option, but it's not everything. And in many cases, having an insider might be easier, quicker, and cheaper. Uh, for instance, this week, uh, Madge did the hearing in the US Congress, and he mentioned that uh, India had agents in Twitter, uh, China had agents in Twitter, and we know from the uh, Department of Justice in 2020 that they, they managed to dismantle a whole network of Saudi intelligence agents in Twitter again. So maybe it's easier for, instead of trying to hack Twitter, just hire someone inside and call them and tell them, hey, tell me who is doing that or that. All the, all the other cases that I mentioned that, uh, yeah, having an insider might be easy just to install something so that you can bypass all of the controls. Or you could use both. And for people that want to do research, first of all, what nation state, and I mean intelligence agents, hate the most is public exposure. They are designed, they are, everything around the culture of intelligence is operating in the shadows. I have talked with lots of people, former people in agencies. This is what, like, they don't even want to consider going public. So what should we do? Anytime we find something like that, go public, talk about it. And also push for change. If you see a vendor that they are not working in this optimal way or they are not letting your people poke in their device for whatever reasons of uh, like tampering their device, don't work with them. Make it public that this vendor is not working in a secure manner. Also, there are many areas that we are not touching a lot, like uh, network tampering, integrity. Well, I mentioned them here. You can see them. Mobile phone threat analysis, script analysis. And uh, blind spots on the internet, lots of blind spots. So every time we use a thread feed from a vendor, remember that this vendor gets this from instant response and sensors they have deployed in the world. Most likely, there are many places in the world they have no sensors and no incident response. And uh, that was it. Thanks, everyone. Uh, you can contact me in any of those. I will also be around because I don't think we have a lot of time for questions, but we might have some time. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we do have some uh, uh, questions from the audience to start with. Uh, and first of all, I would like to ask you, because nation state and, uh, has been a very, like, term that's have a very broad meaning, when it, especially when re you read the news. Do you feel there is a misperception of what's actually nation state and state sponsored? And the, do you have any comments about the terminology? Oh, yeah, in general? there is a whole categorization. Actually, the US government has like a state sponsored state, um, what is it? Uh, state supported. Um, like they have a whole subcategorization, but here I'm talking about the actual intelligence organizations that are belonging to the government or the military, not. I, I, let's say auxiliaries or proxies they could use uh, during those activities. Um, okay, the, the next question was, uh, all, all of this leak, how has this affected your work? I mean, working before Snowden with this research and, and uh, all the leaks that happened, how, how has that affected your research? And do you think there is a wider acceptance? Uh, the, that I, I think it is easier to talk about these things, not only with Snowden, like with all of the leaks that happen all the time. Snowden, of course, it was a big bunch of leaks, but Shadow Brothers, WikiLeaks, uh, also from time to time, like uh, Vice uh, releases, The Intercept, they keep on releasing classified information. So it is uh, nice because you can, let's say, for instance, you might knew that these things are happening. You might have an idea, you might have indications, but you get the full picture. So it, uh, let's say it helps you complete the puzzle of how things are put together. Um, another great question, like, like, is there a government we can trust? I, I, don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. I wouldn't trust uh, any government. Uh, Mainly because governments are people. I'm certain in all of governments, the majority of the people have very good intentions and they want to do the right thing. But it will, there will always be things that, are, like people, that they will try to abuse that. And also, again, from my limited experience or research, all of the governments put government first and people second. And all the military puts military first and people second. Which means if they have to choose between, okay, should we do all these things that might not be that great for all, to all of the people, or 
should we not do it because it's going to violate their human rights? Well, they're going to do it most likely. Um, okay, and, and a, a question about your closing comments, which was like to, to open source and always bring out in the, out it in the light. But should we be worried that that open source researchers this is presented at this conference are weaponized uh, and actually put into these programs? And, and Absolutely, yeah, I'm certain. A good example is uh, Lucas' talk from yesterday that uh, that was released as a zero nights uh, talk initially. And then uh, Lucas figured out that some government was already abusing it to hack hotels in Sweden. So, yeah, of course, uh, the same way that we learn from all of the conferences, uh, yeah, nation states are also learning. Okay, uh, thank you very much for an enlightening uh, presentation. Uh, and, um, yeah, we're going to have a short 50 minutes break uh, and be back here uh, quarter past two. Thank you very much.